Well, Chris Marvin, uh, good evening everyone, and thanks very much indeed to the Scottish Socialist Party for an invite here. I was in Court Theatre on Saturday night there, and Angus Peter Campbell, who many of you are most unlikely to know perhaps, is a, a poet in both Gaelic and English. And he, told, he, he, uh, he said, did you hear about the Lewisman? He loved his wife so much, he nearly told her. <laughs> I say that because we're a very socially conservative lot, the Scots, and what we need is we need passion like we heard from John McCallion. But for people to be passionate, they need to know the facts, and my great fear is they are not being told the facts. Now, we could spend all night, but as she says, they don't, whinging about the media. We we'll must get on with it. So, this particular proposition, you'll be better off with uh, independence. Well, um, we've been told for decades the answer to that is no, or too wee, or too incompetent, we just weren't able to do things. Simple answer is, if you look at various sources, GERS, the, the, GERS, the uh, Government Expenditure Revenue Scotland figures, three out of four years Scotland in surplus, there's information in the uh, UK Parliament's library that will show all the accounts that's in, in, uh, not in dispute. Dennis Healy, Dennis Healy was very frank, I thought, recently, where he told us, yes, you've been ripped off for a year. Um, so we know that. The other facts is, and I'm not going to dazzle you with uh, figures, not least because I generally forget them, um, but it's something like 9.8% paid in, 9.5% back, the equivalent of £500 for every man, woman and child in Scotland. I have to tell you, that's not what motivates me. I'm, I am a nationalist, but first and foremost an internationalist, and I care very, very uh, deeply about uh, people uh, across the globe, and uh, I don't like greed, I don't like bullying, and these are two of the hallmarks of the British state. So when we're talking about politics, we have to uh, be very clear who benefits from some of the, the propositions that have uh, um, underpinned the way we've been governed for years. And I would say it's British elites, and the elites are the military, the public schools, the bankers, the multinationals, pharmaceuticals. All of these people have had an impact in the lives of ordinary people. You know, I'm uh, helping a young woman at the moment with a, an appeal uh, I won't go into any great detail about it, uh, but uh, other than to say, you know, videoing her mobility and the impact it has on a preschool child, the impact it has on her, uh, the well-being in the household with the, the freedom that additional mobility gives her husband counts for nothing because they're looking at the bottom line of these figures. And I have to say, I don't blame NHS Highland. I blame the pharmaceuticals. We should be ensuring that uh, public money uh, is not fostering private profit. And I have to tell you that across the globe, and particularly in the UK, that is the case. And that's that's why that's why uh, Britain is one of the is the fourth most unequal country in the developed world. In my uh, town where I live in Inverness, a mile apart, life expectancy for men there's a 14-year difference. What a damning indictment to all of us in an oil-rich country, in a country that's obscene with wealth, in a country that felt capable fairly recently to give 130,000 millionaires a £100,000 tax break, something I don't think the Labour Party are committed to, to, to reversing. <coughs> that shows how uh, deeply wrong things are and how we need change. Now, John's absolutely right when he says that uh, the uh, Better Together, Bitter Together, No Campaign, call them what you will, are trying to characterise this not simply as the SNP's campaign, but actually very often Alex Sands' campaign. Because as someone who chapped in doors and others will know, you get a very, very polarised reaction. He's loved the road, there's nothing in between. And they're playing on the personal dislike that there is for the man. But I have to say it's doing the whole debate no justice at all. If anyone saw the Sunday Herald's coverage, where 134 words was it that the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland's Prime Minister felt uh, able to, to, to share with you on that. So, whose interests are served by the policies? And I think there's ample evidence that when Scotland has had control of um, uh, its own affairs, that it's set an example, and John's touched on a few of them, and I'll, I'll reiterate them, free personal care, free prescriptions. If we can't look after the sick people in our country, then it's a sick nation we have. And compare that with what's happening south of the border. And before, before we do that comparison, let me say that a lot of folks say to me, terrible problems with the NHS. And of course, this is on the back of news coverage, which does not differentiate between what's happening south of the border and what's happening in the devolved uh, administrations. So, south of the border, 
uh, you have virgin healthcare, you have other uh, profit being made from people's illness, uh, and a situation whereby if you ask for minutes of what should be a public service, you'll be told with commercial incompetence. Now that's an obscenity that we're not going to see in Scotland. And we're not going to see in Scotland whether there is a yes or a no vote at all, um, if things stay as they, as they are. But as John says, we're under great threat here. There is a backlash. And it's been hinted at. It's been hinted at from some bizarre quarters, I would say. And I'm not for re repeating the, the doom stories. But what we do have is that broadly, in my mind, a social democratic consensus in the Scottish Parliament. And that is what's delivered the free personal care, the free prescriptions, the free travel, the free education. And I would, I would like to build on that. Uh, I would like to put a radical edge in that. Because I think there is scope for more. The, uh, not such a big issue here, but should be expanded to, to the urban areas. And there is a potential for that to happen. Community ownership. And John talked about the different versions of, of ownership that should be available. I, uh, I see a real benefit in that. If you look at the innovation that's gone around after the Assam Crofters bought out that land, you have uh, Wicked landowners, wicked is the right term. There's a school up there, you know, they were in, uh, they were taken to, to task, is it Lothimber or Kenneth Berwick, never mind, uh, Lothimber, uh, where it was a nasty family, well it doesn't matter because they're all nasty devils anyway. <laughs> um, the, um, they were, the, the county council, the then Sutherland County Council flexed its muscles and said you must provide land for the, the school. And what they said is you can have that bit of lock there. So people go, what a lovely school, you know, it's, it's built on this lock. You have to fill in the lock. That's what they did. They wouldn't even give them peat to, to hold on and to hold on the water. So uh, I want to, to see an end to that. I want to see an end to the tax breaks. And one of the figures I do want to give you, though, is Oxfam tell us that, wait for it, $18.5 trillion has been held for individuals in tax havens one third of it in British Overseas Territories and Crown Dependencies. Now, I believe we're in for another purge on uh, benefit uh, fraud, and I have to tell you, and it's not because I'm a former police officer, that I don't want a single brass halfpenny of public money to be misappropriated. Not a single brass halfpenny. But the UK Treasurer, Treasury is very keen to do cost-benefits analysis, and I have to say that getting a fraction of that, rather than harassing someone for the modest sum they may have wrongly claim is the direction of travel I would like to see happen with the, uh, the revenue and here, here. customs. Uh, can I say that the revenue and customs, after George Osborne's recent thing, the revenue and customs very, very excitedly that afternoon sent all the MSPs um, uh, an email. And I had to be sitting at my desk and uh, this email came in and it said we've been given revised targets for Tate to look at tax avoidance and tax evasion. And I was like, well, this is it's, it's an automated thing, but I replied to the machine, that's great, can I suggest you stop taking folk out for lunch? Because if you're not, if you recall, they took the money from Vodafone out for lunch and wrote off 1.2 billion. And that's the same organisation that was wanting to sack public sector workers and WIC in the small tax office there, somewhere that would make a significant difference to the population having a modest uh, presence there. So, whose interests are served with these? Um, there's another phrase I came across, political equality is nothing in the face of massive economic inequality. In my word, that's what we have. And how do we address that? Well, I actually am strongly in favour of more progressive taxation. It's ridiculous that someone in my salary isn't taxed considerably more than they are. Yeah, when I started working, tax was 33 pence in the pound. People rightly had an expectation about public services. The streets were swept. In the highlands where I was, every stretch of road had a man with a shovel and a brush and a, a push bike that was maintaining the roads. That is public service. That is public service. Now we have a situation where all the principal uh, political parties, including the one I was a member of for 40 years, has policies predicated on low taxation, but Scandinavian-style um, public services. Now, I'm no economist, but these two things don't go together. They simply don't go together. And I think we need much more. I mean, we've seen the... Uh, Talked about the, the free health care, free childcare would be a tremendous boon to, to, uh, to women, I have to say. No, it should be to all of us, but it's a boon to women. Now, yeah, I just heard someone the other day who's giving up work because they can't afford the reduction in the tax credits that plus the cost of childcare. What a ridiculous situation by a government fixated 
in having people in employment, or facetted in having figures that suggest that they're gainful employment, when we know a lot of them are zero hours contract and get ripped off by multinationals, many of whom have been the recipients of public money. So um, I'm not a fan of uh, a new Scotland that would see a reduction in corporation tax. I'm not wanting um, John Swinney to go in a bidding war with Gideon Osborne about what should be uh, uh, attractive for the multinationals. Multinationals will come and make their profits wherever. Um, and uh, uh, I would like to see um, an expansion of childcare. I'd like to see an expansion of free public transport and when the Scottish Socialist Party were in the Parliament. And have to be given credit for the role that was played in the man of my right here, um, for the role that was played in the free prescriptions in, in the Scottish Socialist Party's time. And it's something that John said there earlier on, um, to tackle that change. Because, you know, people are resistant to change. People are wary of change. I, I spoke at a, 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 a meeting on Friday night in Gale. There was about 60 or 70 folk there. Um, it was myself and Jean Urquhart and Dave Stewart, um, Labour, and I, I get on well with Dave. And the first question was, can we afford it? And Dave Stewart put a big folder, Project Fear in the front. Uh, <laughs> Dave stood up, and in that first answer, had embassies, border posts, Scotland at war, RBS, <laughs> the um, naval fleet, um, protecting oil rigs, and you don't have the oil. And it was have to say, you know, so we have to, I would like to see an informed media. I don't want, I don't want a biased media. I want a media that reports the facts and analyzes what people purport to be the facts. And I have to say thus far, the STUC who at the tail end of last year said, here are the 12 major issues that we think there's a deficiency both in the yes and no can. That's the sort of debate we should be having. Yeah. Um, we have a situation with the post office coming up here where we're going to see um, public money funding uh, further private profit. Um, and I, that, for me, that's uh, not the way ahead. There are opportunities. There's no guarantees. I have to say there's absolutely no guarantees with independence how things will go. But I'm fascinated at any Treasury predictions because if John Swinney were to chat the door and say, how much are we getting in two years' time? Is he? There you go. There you go. So any projection 30 years ahead, because they're the very same folk who, of course, were saying, um, well, that oil's going to run out. That's terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. And then Osborne was up there. That's tremendous. Record investment. Now, of course, it's more challenging. Of course, it's more challenging. And there's something, if I may just touch on, that maybe seems a bit off uh, script a wee bit. But, um, We'll all know, or, or, or have people who know, people that work you know, on the oil rigs, and it's absolutely important that the maximum safety is given to these people. They are the people that's produced all that wealth for London. And in, uh, in recognition of the 25th anniversary of the uh, Piper Alpha disaster, what uh, Her Britannic Majesty's government did was actually was to end the offshore division of Health and Safety Executive and give them a different focus. Um, if you imagine the, the, the worry that's with families and I have a, a, a my old neighbour two doors away is an electrician that works offshore and with two young kids, and of course they're going to be worried. They're worried about the helicopters and they're worried about uh, the priority that's given to safety. So I'm delighted. I've uh, been very keen to support the trade union's role of being guaranteed seats on the choppers that are there so that they can go and do their health and safety checks. Uh, because we have to rely on, on the government. The government has one occupational health inspector uh, um, for the whole of the north of England and Scotland. They have no capacity to be proactive. They have little capacity to revisit issues. And this is why they're not furious anywhere on Twitter. Each health and safety sector are very active in Twitter. It's things like there was a baker shop in Shrewsbury and you know, they issued a warning about the blade of their baking cutter and things like that. Very important. Don't want anyone as a former bacon slicer at Willie Lowe's myself. I know it's of bacon cutting machines. Um, now taken over by Tesco or one of these nasty multinationals. So the other aspect that we have to look at is the opportunity that will be afforded us with independence to revisit some of the erosion of workers' terms and conditions. You're not going to get that with the Labour Party. The Labour Party are not interested in that. And they are interested in that for a simple reason, arithmetic. And it's the arithmetic that says, unless they appeal to the sway of the voters in the southeast of England, they are not going to be elected. And you don't do that talking about blacklisting. And you don't do that talking about workers' rights. And you don't do that talking about that. 
enhanced role for health and safety. And you don't do that by saying what a ridiculous situation now that on top of all the uh, inhibitions that were, uh, or, or inhibitors, I should say, that were put in the place of workers to take their case to an employment tribunal that they're now paying fees up front. So there are opportunities, there are no guarantees. And as John says, uh, we have to, um, and it's back to the money that went to his wife um, and almost told her, we need to get out there because people don't know. If you've attended some of the bedroom tax meetings and seen disabled people in tears of frustration at the circumstances they found themselves in, you have a situation where in the Highlands where I am, and of course this is replicated across the place, 500 plus kids relying on food banks. Hometown of Fergoyim, a food bank. You know, these are these are places where in the past there was employment uh, and, and times are good. Times are good, of course. You know, we encounter the people who who experience the bad times. Times are good. They've been popping the champagne pots in the city of London ever since the Lib Dems let the Tories in. And of course, uh, after today's vote, it's got a ringing endorsement for the austerity policies. We need to change that. We need to change that. Now, you know, I, I want to see um, shipbuilders on the Clyde um, maintain that their work. If that work is diversifying into um, offshore renewables on a personal level, that's far more attractive to me than building a warship. It's far more attractive than building an aircraft carrier with no blooming aircraft to go on. So, I mean, I'll take no lectures on defence priorities from the UK Defence. I'll take no lectures on what should be a priority for welfare for people who are treating the most vulnerable in our communities and we, you know, didn't go into the, all the detail that you're aware of of disabled people, their carers, exemptions for foster children, access for children. Shocking, utterly shocking situation. So there's an opportunity ahead and I hope you'll take that. Bashir Ahmed was the first um, Asian MSP elected to the Scottish Parliament. He was a man who'd come over from Pakistan and had been very, very impressed with the welcome he got. He was a fanatical Scot and he was a real ambassador. And what he said is, it's, it's not where we're from that's important, it's where we're going together. I think there's a better future if we take the yes route. I hope you'll take that route with me. <coughs>